Krishnamurti in dialogue with Dr. Alan W. Anderson. J. Krishnamurti was born in South India and educated in England. For the past 40 years, he has been speaking in the United States, Europe, India, Australia, and other parts of the world. From the outset of his life's work, he repudiated all connections with organized religions and ideologies and said that his only concern was to set men absolutely, unconditionally free. He is the author of many books, among them The Awakening of Intelligence, The Urgency of Change, Freedom from the Known, and The Flight of the Eagle. This is one of a series of dialogues between Krishnamurti and Dr. Alan W. Anderson, who is Professor of Religious Studies at San Diego State University, where he teaches Indian and Chinese scriptures and the oracular tradition. Dr. Anderson, a published poet, received his degree from Columbia University and the Union Theological Seminary. He has been honored with a Distinguished Teaching Award from the California State Universities. Mr. Krishnamurti, uh, during our conversations, one thing has emerged uh, for me uh, with, with, I'd say, an arresting force, and uh, that is on the one hand, we've been talking about thought and knowledge in terms of a dysfunctional relationship to it, but never once have you said that we should get rid of thought. Oh, okay. Okay. And you've never said that, that knowledge as such in itself uh, has something profoundly the matter with it. Therefore, the relationship between intelligence and thought arises and the question of what seems to be that which maintains a creative relationship between intelligence and thought. Perhaps some primordial activity which abides. And in thinking on this, uh, I wondered whether you would agree that perhaps in the history of human existence, the concept of God has been generated out of a relationship to this abiding activity, which concept has been very badly abused. And it raises the whole question of the phenomenon of religion itself. Uh, I wondered if we might discuss that today. Yes. You know, the word like religion, <coughs> love or God, has almost lost all its meaning. Mm -hmm. They have abused these words so enormously. A religion has become a vast superstition, a great propaganda incredible beliefs and superstitions, worship of images made by the hand or by the mind. So, when we talk about religion, I would like, if I may, to be quite clear that we are, both of us, are using the word religion in the real sense of that word, not in the either Christian or the Hindu or the Muslim or the Buddhist or all the um, stupid things that are going on in this country in the name of religion. I think the word religion means gathering together all energy at all levels, physical, moral, mm. spiritual, at all levels, gathering all this energy which will bring about a great attention. And in that attention there is no frontier. And then from there move. To me that is the, the meaning of that word, the gathering of total energy to 
understand what thought cannot possibly capture. Thought is never new, never free, and therefore it's always conditioned, fragmentary, and so on, which we discussed. Mm-hmm. So religion is not a thing put together by thought, or by fear, or by the pursuit of satisfaction and, a, and pleasure, but something totally beyond all this, which isn't romanticism, speculative belief or sentimentality. And I think if we could keep to that, to the meaning of that word, putting all aside all the superstitious nonsense that is going on in the world, in the name of religion, which has become really quite a circus, however beautiful it is, then I think <coughs> we could, from there, start, if you will, yes. if you agree to the meaning of that word. I've been thinking as you've been speaking that in the biblical tradition there are actual statements from the prophets, which seem to point to what you're saying. Such things uh, come to mind as uh, Isaiah's taking the, the part of the divine when he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways not your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts and your thoughts. So stop thinking about me in that sense. And, and, and don't try to find a means to me that you've contrived, since my ways are higher than, than your ways. And then I was thinking, while you were speaking, concerning this act of attention, this gathering together yeah, of, yeah. of all energies, of the whole man, yeah. the, the very simple, be still and know that I'm God. Be still. It's amazing when one thinks of the history of religion, how little attention has been paid to that as compared with ritual. But I think. When we lost touch with the nature, with the universe, with the clouds, lakes, birds, when we lost touch with all that, then the priests came in. Then all the superstition, fears, exploitation, all that began. But the priests became the mediator Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. between the human and the so-called divine. And I I believe, (coughs) if you have read Uh Rig Veda, or I was told about it, because I don't read all this, that there, in the first Veda, there is no mention of God at all. There is only this worship of something immense, expressed in nature, in, in the earth, in the clouds, in the trees, in the beauty of vision. But that being very, very simple, the priest said, that's too simple. <laughs> Let's mix it up. Let's a mix it up. Let's <laughs> little confuse it a little bit, <laughs> and then begin. Mm. I believe this is traceable from the ancient Vedas to present time, where the priest became the interpreter, the um, the mediator, the explainer, the exploiter. The man who said, this is right, this is wrong, you must believe this, or you go to perdition, and so on, so on, so on. He generated fear, Mm -hmm. not the adoration of beauty, 
not the adoration of uh, a life lived totally, wholly without conflict, but something placed outside there, beyond and above what he considered to be God, and pro made propaganda for that. So I feel if we could, from the beginning, use the word religion in the simplest way, that is, the gathering of all energy so that there is total attention, and in that quality of attention, the immeasurable comes into being. Mm -hmm. Because, as we said the other day, the measurable is the mechanical. Yes. Yes. Which the West has cultivated, made marvelous, mm -hmm. technologically, physically, medicine, science, biology, and so on, so on, which has made the world so superficial, mechanical, worldly, mm, materialistic, and that is spreading all over the world. And in reaction to that, this materialistic attitude, there are all these superstitious, nonsensical, unreasoned religion that, that is going on. I don't know if you saw the other day the absurdity of these gurus coming from India and teaching the West how to meditate, how to hold breath, how they say, I am God, worship me, and falling their death. You know, it has become so absurd. Yes. And childish, so utterly immature. All that indicates the degradation of the world religion and the human mind that can accept this kind of circus and idiocy. Mm -hmm. now, yes, yes, no, please, go, go ahead. I, I, was, I was thinking of a remark uh, of Sri Aurobindo's in, in a study that he made of, of the Veda. Uh, where he traced its decline in this sentence. He said it, it issues as language from sages, then it falls to the priests, and then after the priests it falls to the scholars or the academicians. But in, in that study, uh, th there was no statement that I found as to how it ever fell to the priests. And I was wondering whether... I think this fairly simple. Yes, please. I think that's fairly simple, how the priest got hold of the whole business. Because a man is so concerned with his own petty little affairs, hmm? petty little desires and ambitions, superficiality, he wants something little more. He wants little more romantic, little more Mm, sentimental, more something other than the daily, beastly routine of living. So uh, he looks somewhere and the priest says, hey, hey, come over here, I've got the goods. Mm. I, I think it's very simple how, wh where, how the priests have come in. It is ex you see it in India, you see it in the West, you see it everywhere where man begins to be concerned with daily living, the daily operation of bread and butter and house and all the rest of it, he demands something more than that. He says, after all, I'll die, but there must be something more. So fundamentally, it's a matter of, of securing of for course. himself some Heavenly some, grace. Some heavenly grace that will preserve him against falling into this 
mournful round of coming to be and passing away. Yeah. Thinking of the past on the one hand, anticipating the future on the other, you're saying he falls out of the present now. Yes, that's right. I understand. So if we could keep to that meaning of that word, religion, then from there the question arises, can the mind be so attentive in the total sense that the unnameable comes into being. You see, personally, I've never read any of these things, Vedas, Bhagavad Gita, Upanishads, all the rest of it, or any philosophy. But I questioned everything. Yes. Could not question only, but observe. And I s one sees the absolute necessity of a mind that's completely quiet. Mm -hmm. Because it's only out of quietness you you perceive what is happening. If you are, if I am chattering, I, can't, I won't listen to you. If my mind is constantly rattling away, what you are saying, I can't, I won't pay attention. Mm -hmm. To pay attention means to be quiet. There have been some priests, apparently, who usually ended up in a great deal of trouble for it. There have been some priests uh, who, who had the it seems, a grasp of this. I was thinking of, of Meister Eckhart's uh, remark that uh, wh whoever is able to read the Book of Nature doesn't need any scriptures at all. At all. That just is. Of course, uh, he ended up in very <laughs> great trouble. Uh, after, yes, he had a bad time toward the end of his life, and uh, after he died, uh, the, the Church denounced him. Of course, of course. I mean, all, organized belief as Church and all the rest of it is, is too obvious. You know, there is no, it isn't subtle, it isn't, it hasn't got the quality of real depth and real spirituality. You know what it is. Yes, I do. So, I'm asking, what is the quality of a mind, and therefore heart and brain, what is the quality of a mind that can perceive something beyond the measurement of thought. Mm -hmm. What is the quality of a mind? Because that quality is the religious mind. Mm -hmm. That quality of a mind that is capable, that has this feeling of being sacred in itself, and therefore is capable of seeing something immeasurably sacred. The, the word devotion seems to imply this when it's grasped in its proper sense. Uh, the, to use your earlier phrase, uh, gathering together yes. uh, toward a, a one-pointed, attentive... Uh, it, attention is... would you say attention is one-pointed? No, I, I didn't mean to imply focus when I said one-pointed. Yeah, that's what I wanted. I meant rather integrated into itself as utterly quiet and, and uh, unconcerned uh, about taking thought for what is ahead or what is behind. Simply, simply being there. Uh, the word there isn't good either because it suggests that uh, there's a where and a here and all the rest of it. Uh, it is very difficult to, to, uh, to find, it seems to me, language to do justice to what you're saying. Uh, 
precisely because when we speak, utterance is in time, and, and it is progressive. It, it has a quality, doesn't it, uh, more like music than we see in graphic art. You can stand before a picture, whereas to, to hear music and grasp its theme, uh, you virtually have to wait until you get to the and end and end gather it all up. <laughs> okay. And with, with language, you have the same, the same difficulty. No, I think so, Wung Chu. When we are inquiring into this problem, what is, what is the nature and the structure of a mind, and therefore the quality of a mind, that is not only sacred and holy in itself, but is capable of seeing something immense. Mm -hmm. As we were talking the other day about suffering, personal and the sorrow of the world, it isn't that we must suffer. <coughs> suffering is there. Mm -hmm. Every human being has a dreadful time with it, and there is suffering of the world. And it isn't that one must go through it, but as it is there, one must understand it and go beyond it. And that's one of the qualities of a religious mind, in the sense we are using that word, that is incapable of suffering. It has gone beyond it, which doesn't mean that it becomes callous. On the contrary, it is a passionate mind. Hmm? Uh, <coughs> one of the things, one of the things that that I have thought much about during our conversations is language itself. On the one hand, we say, such a mind, as you've been describing, is one that, that is present to suffering. It, 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 do, it does nothing to push it away, on the one hand. And yet, it is somehow able to, to contain it. Not, not put it in a vase or, or a barrel and contain it in that yeah. sense. Uh, and yet the very word itself, to, to suffer, means to, to undercarry. Uh, and it seems close to understand. Uh, over and over again in our conversations, I've been thinking about the customary way in which we use language as as a use that, that deprives us of really seeing the glory of what the word points to itself in itself. Uh, I was thinking about the word religion when, when we were speaking earlier. Yes, uh, scholars differ as to where that came from. On the one hand, some say that it, that it means to bind. The bind. Church Fathers uh, 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 spoke about that. And then others say, no, no, it, it, it means uh, uh, the numinous or the splendor that cannot be exhausted by thought. Uh, it seems to me that, wouldn't you say, that, that uh, there's another sense to bind that is not a, a negative one, in the sense that uh, if one is making this act of attention. Uh, one isn't bound as with cords of ropes, no, but one, one, is, one is there, uh, or here. You see, so I, now again, let's be clear. <coughs> when we use the at word attention, there's a difference between concentration and attention. Yes, yes. Concentration is exclusion. I concentrate. 
that is, bring all my thinking to a certain point. Whereas, uh, and therefore, it is excluding, bar building a barrier so that it can focus its whole attention on that, whole concentration on that. Whereas, attention is something entirely different from concentration. In that, there is no exclusion. In that, there is no resistance. In that, there is no effort. And therefore, no frontier, no limits. How, how, would, you, how would you feel about the, the word receptive in this uh, respect? Uh, again, with who is it that is to receive? Already we've made a division, division with that word. Yeah. I think the word attention is a really very good word. Because mm. it, it not only understands concentration, not only sees the duality of reception, the receiver and the received, and also it sees the nature of duality and the conflict of the opposites, and attention means not only the brain giving its energy, but also the mind, the heart, the nerve, the total entity, total human mind, giving all its energy to be at, to perceive. I think that's <coughs> that's the meaning of that word for me at least. To be attentive. Attend, not constantly. Attend. That means listen, see, give your heart to it, give your mind to it, give your whole being to this, to attend. Otherwise, you can't attend. If I'm thinking about something else, I can't attend. No. If I'm hearing my own voice, I can't attend. There's a metaphorical use of the word waiting in Scripture. Uh, it's interesting that in English, too, we, we use the word attendant uh, in terms of one who waits on. Uh, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to penetrate the, the uh, notion of, of waiting uh, and and patience in relation to this. I I think this, so. Waiting again means one who is waiting for something. Again, there is a duality in that. And <coughs> when you wait, you are expecting. Mm -hmm. Again, a duality. One who is waiting. <coughs> about to receive. So, if, if we could, for the ma moment, hold ourselves to that word, <coughs> attention, then we should inquire, what is the quality of a mind that is so attentive that it, is, that it has understood lives, acts, in relationship and responsibility as behaviour, mm -hmm. and has no fear psychologically in that we talked about, and therefore understands the movement of pleasure, then we come to the point, what is such a mind? I think it would be worthwhile if we could discuss the nature of hurt. Of hurt? Yes. Why human beings are hurt? All people are hurt. You mean with both the physical and the psychological? Psychological, especially. Especially the psychological, psychological. yes. Mm -hmm. Physically, we can tolerate it. Yes. 
we can bear up with a pain and say, well, I won't let it interfere with my thinking. I won't let it mm, corrode my psychological quality of mind. I can watch over it. Mind can watch over that. But the psychological hurts are much more important and difficult to grapple with and understand. Yes, yes, yes. I think it is necessary because a mind that is hurt is not an innocent mind. Mm -hmm. The very, very word in innocent comes from nurture, uh, not to hurt. A mind that is incapable of being hurt. And there's a great beauty in that. Yes, there is. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a marvelous, uh, it's a, it's a marvelous word. We have usually used it to indicate a lack of something. I know. And yes, and th th there was turned on and upside down again. And the yes. Christians have made it such a absurd thing of it. Yes, I, I, I understand that. So, I think we ought to, when we in discussing religion, we ought to inquire very, very deeply the nature of hurt. Because if a mind that is not hurt is an innocent mind, and you need to, this quality of innocence to be so totally attentive. If I've been following you correctly, I think maybe uh, you would say, wouldn't you, that, that uh, one becomes hurt when he starts thinking about thinking that he's hurt. Look, uh, it's much deeper than that, isn't it? From childhood, the parents compare the child with another child. But that's when that thought arises. Uh, that, there it is. When you compare, you are hurting. Yes. No, we say, but we do it. Oh, yes, of course we do it. Of Therefore, course. is it possible to live a educate a child without comparison, without imitation, and therefore never get hurt in, in, in that way. And one is hurt because one has built an image about oneself. The image which has built about oneself is a form of resistance a wall between you and me. And when you touch that wall at its tender point, I get hurt. So, not to compare in education, not to have an image about oneself, that's one of the most important things in life not to have an image about oneself. If you have, you are inevitably going to be hurt. Ah, suppose one has an image that one is um, very good, or that one should be a great success, or that one has uh, great capacities, gifts, and you know, the images that one builds. Inevitably, you are going to come and prick it. Inevitably, uh, accidents and incidents happen that's going to break that. And I get, one gets hurt. Doesn't this raise the question of name, the yes. use of name? <coughs> name, form. The child is given a name. The child identifies himself with a name. Yes, I can identify my, the child can identify itself, but without the image, just a name. Brown. Hmm? Mr. Brown, well, there is nothing to it. But the moment he builds an image that Mr. Brown is <coughs> socially, morally different, superior or inferior, if mm -hmm. ancient or comes from a very old family, belongs to a certain <coughs> higher class, aristocracy, moment that begins, and when that is encouraged and sustained by thought, Snobism, you know, hold up. Mm -hmm. uh, then you are 
inevitably going to be hurt. Then <clears throat> what you're saying, I take it, is that the radical confusion here is involved in the imagining oneself to be his name. Yeah, and identification all the with the name, with the body, with, with the idea of socially different. Mm -hmm. That your parents, your grandparents were lords or this or that, you know, the whole snobbism of England and all that. Mm -hmm. And different kind of snobbism in this country. We, we speak in the language of preserving a name. Yeah, yeah. And in India it is the Brahman, the non-Brahman, the whole business of that. So, through education, through tradition, through propaganda, we have built an image about ourselves. Is there a relation here in terms of religion, would you say, uh, to the refusal for instance, uh, in the Hebraic tradition, to pronounce the name of the God. The name. I, the word is not the thing, anyhow. Yes. So you can pronounce it or not pronounce it. No, if you know the word is never the thing, the description is never the described, then it doesn't matter. Now, well, one of the reasons I've always been, uh, over the years, deeply drawn to the study of uh, the roots of words uh, is simply because, for the most part, they point to the something direction. very yes. concrete. Very. It's either a thing, yes, uh, or it's a gesture. Uh, more often than not, it's some act. Quite, quite. Some act. When I used the phrase "thinking about thinking before," I, I should have been more careful of my words and referred to mulling over the image, which would have been a much better right. way to yeah. put it, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yes. So, yes. can a child be educated never to get hurt? And I have heard professors, scholars say, child must be hurt in order to live in the world. Mm. And when I asked him, do you, do you want your child to be hurt? He kept absolutely quiet. He was just talking theoretically. Now, unfortunately, through education, through social structure and the nature of our society in which we live, we have been hurt, we have images about ourselves, which are going to be heard, and <coughs> is it possible not to create images at all? I don't know if I'm making myself... You clear. are. That you is, are. suppose I, I have an image about myself, which I have, unfortunately. If I, <coughs> if I have an image, is it possible to wipe it away, hmm? to understand it and therefore dissolve it, and never to create a new image about myself. You understand? Living in a society, being educated, I have built an image, inevitably. Now, can that image be wiped away? Wouldn't it disappear with this complete act of attention? That's what I'm coming to gradually. It would totally disappear. But I must understand how this image is born. I can't just say, well, I'll wipe it out. You know? mm -hmm. Yes, we have to. Use, use attention as a means of wiping it out. It, it doesn't work that way. In understanding the image, in understanding the hurts, in understanding the education in which one has been brought up, in the family, the society, the, all that, in understanding of that, out of that understanding comes the attention. Not attention first, and then wipe it out. You can't attend if I'm hurt. You know, if I'm hurt, I, I, how can I uh, attend? 
because that hurt is going to keep me, consciously or unconsciously, from this total attention. The amazing thing, if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, is that even in the study of the dysfunctional history, provided I bring total attention to that, there's going to be a non-temporal relationship Absolutely. between That's the right. active attention and the healing that takes yes. place. Yes. While I am attending, the thing is, the leaving. Thing is leaving. Yes, That's yes. Right. We've got That's inging right. along here That's throughout. Right. That's right. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, uh, there are two questions involved. Is, is the, are the hurts, can the hurts be healed mm -hmm. so that not a mark is left. And is there a possibility, can future hurts be prevented completely, not without, without any resistance, you follow? Mm -hmm. Those are two problems. And they can be understood only and resolved when I give attention to the understanding of my hurt. When I look at it, not translate it, not uh, wish to wipe them away, just to look at it, as we went into that question of perception, just to see my hurts. The hurts I've received, the insults, the negligence, the, <coughs> <coughs> the casual word, hmm? mm -hmm. the gesture, all those hurts and the language one uses, especially in this country. You? Oh, yes, yes. There seems to be a relationship between what you're saying and one of the meanings of the word salvation. To be... Salvare, to save. To save. Safe. To make whole. And to make whole. How can you be whole self? You are hurt. Impossible. Therefore, it is tremendously important to understand this question. Yes, it is. But I'm thinking of a child who comes to school who's already got a freight car uh, filled know. with hurts. Hurts. Uh, we, we're not dealing with a little one in the crib now. We're, no. we're, we're, we're already... Already, we're, re already hurt. Already hurt. And hurt because it's hurt. <laughs> and it multiplies endlessly, of, of doesn't course. it? From that hurt, he's violent. Yes. From that hurt, he's, he's frightened and therefore withdrawing. From that hurt, he will do uh, neurotic things. From that hurt, he will accept anything that gives him safety. God, his idea of God is a, a God who will never hurt. Sometimes a distinction is made between ourselves and animals with respect to this problem. Oh, yes. uh, an, an animal, for instance, that has been uh, hurt. badly hurt will, will be disposed toward everyone uh, in terms of emergency and attack. Yeah, right. But over a period of time, it might take three, four years, uh, if the animal is loved, and so, sir, you see, you said love. Mm -hmm. We haven't got that. No. I mean, the parents no. uh, haven't got love for their children. They may talk about love. Because mm -hmm. the moment they compare the younger to the older, they have, they have hurt the child. Yes. Your father was so clever. You are such a stupid boy. There you begun. In schools, when they give you marks, it's a hurt. Not marks, it's a deliberate hurt. And that is torn. And from that, there is violence, there is every kind of aggression, you know, all that takes place. So how can a mind A mind cannot be made whole or is whole 
unless this is understood very, very deeply. Mm -hmm. The question that, that I had in mind before re regarding what we've been saying is that this animal, if loved, will, provided we're not dealing with brain damage or something, oh, uh, will, in time, love in return. But the thought is that with the human person, uh, love cannot be, in that sense, coerced. Uh, it isn't that one would coerce the animal to love, but that the animal, because innocent, does, in time, simply accept, respond, accept. So, but, so but then a human, person, a human person is doing something we <laughs> don't think the animal is. No, the human being is being hurt and is hurting all the time. Exactly, exactly. Uh, while he's mulling over his <laughs> hurt, then he, he's likely to misinterpret the very act of generosity and love of course. that is made toward him. So, what, so we are involved in, in something uh, very frightful here. By the time the child comes into school, he's seven already, years old. He's already gone, finished, tortured. It's big, there is the tragedy of it, so that's what I mean. Yes, I know. And, and when you ask the question, as you have, uh, is there a way uh, to, to educate the child so that the child... He's uh, never hurt. That is uh, part of education, that's part of culture. Civilization is, is hurting. So look, you see this everywhere, all over the world, this constant comparison, constant imitation, constant saying, you are that, I must be like you. I must be like a Krishna, like Buddha, like Jesus, you follow? That's a hurt. Religions have have hurt people. The child is born to a hurt parent, mm -hmm. and sent so to a school where it is taught by That's a hurt teacher. Now you're asking, is there a way mm -hmm. to educate this child so that the child recovers? I should, I, it is possible, sir. Yes, yes, please, please. That is, when the teacher realizes, when the educator realizes, he is hurt and the child is hurt. Is mm. aware of his hurt and is aware also the child's hurt. Then the relationship changes. Then he, he will, in the very act of teaching, what a mathematics, whatever it is, he is not only freeing himself from his hurt, but also helping the child to be free of his hurt. After all, that is education. To see that I, who am the teacher, I am hurt. I have gone through agonies of hurt. And I want, to, I, want, I want to help that child not to be hurt. And he has come to the school being hurt. So I said, all right, we both are hurt, my friends. <laughs> huh? Let us see. Let us wipe it, help each other to wipe it out. That is the act of love. L comparing the human organism with the animal, I return to the question whether it is the case that this relationship to another human being must bring about this Obviously, so if relationship exists, we said relationship can only exist when there is no image between you and me. But let us say that there's a teacher who has come to grips with this in himself very, very deeply, has, has as you put it, gone into the question yeah. deeper, 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 and deeper, has come to the place where he no longer is hurt-bound. Yes, sir. 
the child that he meets or the young student, student that he meets or even the student his own age because we have adult education now, yes, yes, yes. Uh, is a person who, who is hurt bound and uh, will he not uh, transmit that hurt to another? No, no, will he not uh, because he is hurt bound uh, be prone to misinterpret the activity of the one who is not hurt bound. But there is no person who is not hurt bound, except very, very few. Uh, look, uh, lots of things have happened to me, personally. I've never been hurt. I, I'm, I say this in all uh, humility, in a real sense. I, I don't know what it means to be hurt. Things have happened to me. Have, people have done every kind of thing to me. Praised me, flattered me, kicked me around, everything. It is possible. And <coughs> as a teacher, as an educator, to see the child. And if and I, it is my responsibility as educator to see he's never hurt. Not just teach some beastly subject. It is a form of important. I think I have some grasp of, of, of what you're talking about. I, I, I don't think I could ever, in my wildest dreams, uh, say that I have never been hurt. Though. I do have difficulty, and have since a child, I've even been taken to task for it, uh, dwelling on it. I remember a colleague of mine once saying to me with some testiness when we were discussing a situation in which there was conflict uh, in the faculty, well, the trouble with you is, you see, you can't hate. <laughs> <laughs> and it was looked upon as, as a as a disorder, disorder. In, in terms of being unable to make a focus towards the, the enemy in such a way as, as to uh, devote yes, total attention to that. And, uh, sanity is taken for insanity. Yes. Hmm? <laughs> so so I, I, my reply to him was simply, well, that's right, and we might as well face it, and I don't intend to do anything about quite, that. Quite, quite, but quite. it didn't help the situation no. in terms of no. the interrelationship. A so, uh, question is then, in education, can a teacher, educator, observe his hurts, become aware of them, and in his relationship with the student, resolve his hurt and the student's hurt? That's one problem. It is possible if the teacher is really in the deep sense of the word, educator. That is to cultivate. And the next question, sir, from that arises, is the mind capable of not being hurt, knowing it has been hurt? You follow? Not add more hurts. Uh, mm -hmm. I have these two problems. One, being hurt, that's the past, and never to be hurt again. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't mean I build a wall of resistance, that I withdraw, that I go off into a monastery, or I become s s s drug addict, or some silly things like that. But no hurt. Is that possible? You see the two questions? Now, if <coughs> <coughs> that is, what is hurt? What is the thing that is hurt? You follow? Mm -hmm. What uh, we said, the physical hurt is not the same as psychological no. hurt. So we are dealing with psychological hurt. What is the thing that is hurt? The psyche? The image which I have about myself? It's an investment that I have in it. Yeah. It's my investment in myself. Yes. I've divided myself off from myself. Yeah, in myself. That means, why should I invest in myself? 
What is myself? You for Yes, I do. In which I have to invest something. <laughs> what is myself? All the words, the names, the qualities, the education, the bank account, the furniture, the house, the the herds, the all that is me. In an attempt to answer the question, what is myself, I immediately must resort to all this stuff. Okay, obviously. There isn't any other way. And then I haven't got it. Then I praise myself because I must be so marvelous as somehow to slip out. You right. know? <laughs> right, right. I, I, I see what you mean. So, I, I, yes, go ahead. No, please. please. I, I, I was thinking uh, just a moment back when you were saying it is possible for, for the teacher to come into relationship with the student uh, so that an, a work of healing or an act of healing See, happens. Sir, this is what I would do if I was in a class. That's the first thing I would begin with, not some subject. He said, look, you're hurt and I'm hurt. We're both of us hurt. And point out what hurt does, how it kills people. How it destroys people. Out of that there is violence, out of that is brutality, out of that there I want to hurt people. You follow all that comes in. I would spend ten minutes talking about that. Every day in different ways. Till, the, till both of us see it. Then, as an educator, I will use the right word and the student will use the right word. There will be no gesture, there will be no. We are both involved in it. But we don't do that. The moment we come into the class, we pick up a book and there it goes off. I, uh, if I was an educator, whether with the older people or with the younger people, I would, be, I would establish this relationship. That's my duty, that's my job, that's my function. Not just to transmit some uh, information. Yes, that's that's really very profound. I think one of the reasons that what you have said is so difficult for an educator reared within the whole academic. Yes, because we are never we are we are so vain. Exactly. We want not only to hear that it's possible for this transformation to take place, but we want it to be regarded as, as demonstrably proved yes. and therefore not merely possible, but predictably certain. Certain, yes. And he wants then we're guarantee. back to the whole of thing. Of course, then we're back yeah. into the old rotten stuff. Quite. N n next time, uh, uh, could we take up the relationship of, of love? To, to this. Yes. Well, I, I, I would very much yes, uh, yes. enjoy that. And it would seem to me. It would all come together. To, to come together in yes. the gathering together. <laughs> this program.